Um, my name is Michael Husky. I should introduce myself earlier uh, during the question and answer session from the National Archives. And I'd like to welcome you to our first panel discussion of the day entitled uh, Issues Before Us, Part 1, Legal Issues. And the moderator for our panel today is going to be Mary Morton. So please join me in welcoming Mary and our other panelists, which you will. conversation um, on rights and uh, justice issues, and it's important pardon me, for us to continue these conversations. Uh, this morning, the first panel will really look at the legal issues in the LGBT community. Really, what's next? Right? What's the next frontier, if you will, now that marriage equality is passed? And we have a number of panelists who have different perspectives, I'm happy to say, on these issues. And so I'm going to jump right in. We are going to be uh, ending in approximately an hour, so I want to leave lots of time for our panelists to have uh, an opportunity to not only talk to um, each other, but to talk to all of you. And in your packet, you should have a card, and this is where you can write questions down. We will leave a few moments at the end for some Q&A. And if you have a question, please um, just someone will pass it up to me, uh, and we'll, we will try to get to those questions as well. So let me start by introducing the panel. Um, and I'm starting with, right here at the end, Naomi Goldberg. Naomi is the Director of Policy and Research uh, for the Movement Advancement Project. And this is an LGBT think tank, uh, providing rigorous research, insight, and analysis to help speed equality for LGBT people. And, and in just a moment, Naomi is going to uh, really give us a, some grounding of, of where things stand uh, in the LGBTQ community. And next to Naomi is Jim Bennett. Jim is the Midwest Regional Director of Lambda Legal and um, really took a leadership role, certainly here in Illinois and, and in other states as well. I think you have 10 states that you're responsible for. Isn't it? And um, Jim uh, really was the uh, part of the moving force for marriage equality pardon me, here in Illinois. And um, he also did a lot of work in Indiana. And Indiana, of course, is very much in the news now with the uh, recent announcement about um, uh, the next vice president. Or, oh, goodness. Sorry. 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 Tyrone. Tyrone Hanley he serves as a policy counsel um, at the National Center for Lesbian Rights with our good friend Kate Kendall. And in this role, he supports um, the federal policy initiatives uh, with a focus on criminal justice reform, economic justice, and HIV and AIDS. So, welcome. And uh, we want to welcome Dale Carpenter. We'll actually welcome him back to Chicago. This is where he went to law school. Um, Professor Carpenter is. Um, at the SMU Professor of Law right now, and he's teaching constitutional law as well as LGBT rights. And um, he, as I said, uh, attended law school here, so we're happy to have him. Welcome back to Chicago. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. And I am going to turn this over to Naomi, who's going to take us through a couple of slides and help us a nice grounding for our conversation. Thank you, Mary. So I thought it would be helpful to say, where are we right now? What has changed most recently? So think back a long time ago, back to May 2015, before the Supreme Court ruling um, in marriage. So this is a map that tracks um, LGBT policies and laws. And so this is a map back from May 2015, looking at laws and policies that impact on sexual orientation only. We're going to talk about gender identity in a minute. So at that, we track over 30 laws and policies, about half of those impact sexual orientation. And then we look at states and how they fall out in terms of each of these laws and policies. So before the Supreme Court ruling last year, you see this patchwork that existed for laws um, around sexual orientation specifically. These are laws including access to marriage, parenting rights, non-discrimination laws, laws about safe schools, laws about access to health care. So you see this, this picture where you've got a bunch of states, mostly on the coasts, 
that are pretty high um, in terms of their LGBT or LGB rankings. And then you have this swath sort of through the middle, the south and the middle, with a really negative um, climate um, in terms of laws and policies. Now, what did marriage do? Fast forward to currently. Right? This is a very different picture. And this really, I think, speaks to the impact of marriage and that marriage um, equality, in many ways, was a cascade. Right? It wasn't just, can you legally marry someone? But it attached parenting rights. It attached um, whether you can visit your partner in the hospital, whether you can take family leave, for example. And so this is sort of where we are now in terms of laws and policies specifically about sexual orientation. So we see that there are actually no states in what we call the negative category, but there are eight states that are still in this low policy tally area. Um, you can see they're in the orange. And then there's a lot of states, right? Half of states, 25 states in this, in this pea green color, that are really kind of lacking in, for the most part, non-discrimination laws, they're lacking perhaps in state schools laws, and they're lacking family leave. Those are actually the big, the big categories, state-level family leave policies. So we have certainly seen an improvement, and I think this is starkly different than a year ago, and I, I think it is important to honor that, as much as we can say marriage did not fix everything. So then the question is, what did, what, what did marriage do for laws and policies and can gender identity? Anyone? Absolutely nothing, right? Laws that target people or that address sexual, sexual orientation are totally different than laws and policies that are about gender identity. Often they come together, but we at MAP think about them um, separately and track them separately. So when we look at trans, what the state of the U.S. is for um, trans people and laws specifically about gender identity, this is what the MAP looks like today. This is horrific, in my opinion. Um, so you have 12 states in the Washington, D.C. that we put in the high gender identity category, and you have 23 states, nearly half the country, in this negative gender identity category. And what kind of laws and policies are we talking about here? Um, specifically, we're talking about non-discrimination laws, both employment, housing, public accommodations, schooling, um, whether non-discrimination laws or bullying laws. We're talking about access to identity documents. Can you update your birth certificate? Can you get an accurate driver's license? Can you get health insurance that will actually cover what you need? Or does your state say, sorry, if you're on Medicaid, we don't cover anything trans-related? This is just sort of a big bucket that we put all these laws into. So this is really important because as much as we saw a huge sea change in terms of access to important protections based on sexual orientation, this is where we are in terms of gender identity. And certainly people have multiple identities, right? So trans people can also be lesbian, gay, bisexual, straight. And can, um, but lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, uh, bi people can also be trans. So we're not talking about two mutually exclusive categories of people. There are people living both of these experiences. So I, I want to just dig in a little bit on non-discrimination protections because I think it's going to come up a little bit and give um, some picture of where we are right now. So currently, um, we have 20 states and Washington, D.C. that have explicit protections written to state law that prohibit discrimination in employment, in housing, uh, based on sexual orientation and gender. <coughs> Those are the dark green states. Then we have two states. Um, this map is just showing employment, but um, employment and housing are identical. It's when public accommodations, which we are going to talk about, things get a little different. We have two states that just cover sexual orientation, and then you have the rest of the country, 28 states, where there are no state-level protections. What's important here, though, is sort of the overlap between federal, state, and local policy. Because we have been talking about state-level policies, which map tracks, but we also look at how, does those, how do those intersect with federal law. And so federally right now, there is no law that explicitly prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity in employment, housing, or public accommodations. Now, the, through the EEOC and through other agencies, there is this expanding notion of what is sex discrimination, which is currently prohibited under Title VII and Title IX. Um, and in some cases, the EEOC and other agencies are saying that does include discrimination against transgender people, and in some instances, discrimination based on people, based on their sexual orientation. Um, and so Kai Feldman, who is an EEOC commissioner, speaks very beautifully about that emerging theory. But the EEOC really is just something that courts are supposed to take into consideration. It's not binding on federal courts. Um, and so it has limited impact. 
We really need federal protections. And then you have states, right? As the map I showed before, we have about 20 states that have passed laws and policies um, to, this, to this degree. And then importantly, we have local cities and counties that are saying, hey, I, we're in Texas, we're in Utah before Utah passed protect protections. In Florida, for example, we want to protect people who live in our cities. And so they are passing ordinances that explicitly prohibit discrimination in these various areas. And in Florida, for example, more than 50% of people living in Florida live in a city or county with these protections. So this is not nothing, and it's important. So you sort of have these concentric circles and how they fit together. One thing that I wanted to mention, because I think we are going to talk a little bit about it, um, is the tensions that are happening at these various levels. So in North Carolina, for example, you had a local ordinance that was passed that we were really excited about, and then you had the state kind of come in and say, no, 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 can't do that, and passed a law that now limits, handcuffs cities' abilities to pass ordinances, both on sexual orientation and gender identity and on paid maternity leave or minimum wage laws or plastic bag bans or anything like that. Um, and so these all fit together, and I think that's really important to point out. Um, so this is sort of where we are when we look at um, sexual orientation and gender identity together. Right? So the trans component here, really, you see that overlay in terms of where we are in terms of states. So we have a couple states in the negative tally, Tennessee and Alabama. And then you have a, a large swath of states that are in this low tally, um, and 14 states that are in this high policy tally. And then quickly, because I think that what is so important when we talk about the legal issues is who is the LGBT community. It's one thing to have this idea of who we are and try to legislate or pass policies that help us or hurt us, but if you actually think about who we are and what our needs are, I think that can really drive things. So the LGBT community is incredibly racially and ethnically diverse. Um, one in three LGBT people in a Gallup survey um, identified as a person of color. And when you look at what percent of Americans identify as LGBT, it's 3.4% in this survey. But when you look at folks of color, 4.6% of African Americans, 4.3% of Asians, and 4% of Hispanics. So higher rates in communities of color. We also see that childbearing rates are much higher among LGBT people of color and people of color in same-sex couples. Upwards of 40%, for example, of African American women in same sex couples are raising children. So this is blowing the notion of who is an LGBT person. It's a white, single guy living in New York City, right? This is not who our community is. Um, importantly, we are economically diverse um, with higher rates of economic insecurity. So you see here on your left, um, percents of LGBT people and trans people living in extreme poverty um, on $12,000 less a year or $10,000 less a year. So we are more likely to be living in poverty. Um, and the stats, this is also from Gallup. Uh, folks with kids, it's a huge issue. Um, you see that uh, married or partnered LGBT people with kids are twice as likely to have incomes near the poverty level. And we can talk about why, um, I think, during some of this, when we talk about the impact of laws and policies on people's lives. The last thing I want to leave with um, is some emerging research which echoes much of what we in the LGBT community already knew, but that is that LGBT people are more likely to be involved in systems, whether it's the child welfare system, whether it's the criminal justice system. So you see here that um, LGBT people on the left, that's the charts on the left, we're more than, we're about twice the rate in jails and prisons than we are in, in the rest of the community. 7.9% of people in a federal survey, this is important, a federal survey, um, identified as LGBT in um, America's jails and prisons. And then this study on the right is just incredibly shocking to me. Um, so this is of seven juvenile justice facilities. What percent of kids kids in those facilities identify as LGBT or gender non-conforming? And you see that 40% of girls, right? 20% uh, of all youth, 14% of boys. And we think LGBT kids make up about seven to 9% of the youth population. So this is twice four times the rate. So clearly there's something going on that we, and we're trying to unpack this, and I think Tyrone can talk about this and others, um, but I think that these are just some important issues as we talk about some of the legal issues that um, impact the LGBT community. So I think that's all. Okay, great. Stop. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naomi. Well, that gives us a great uh, starting point for our conversation, and again, just to remind you that we're going to be looking at legal issues, and the second panel will look at some of the socioeconomic issues, but we expect that there'll be overlap. So, 
Let me start um, really by just asking if there's any reaction to the, the stats that Naomi um, just laid out for us. I know that some of them actually surprised me, but some of you may do this work much more closely than I do. I'm sure you do. So what was your, what was your reaction, Jim? Uh, well, I, I can't say I was surprised by it, but the, the numbers, especially of the of youth in prison, is just shocking. And, uh, and I think some of it is uh, because you, we have cops in schools now. So I, when, when you get called in, instead of going to the principal or a counselor, you're, uh, you're headed to a, a, a police officer. And so if you're, if you're just, well, you know, I'm going to take both kids, and, uh, or if this is the kid that always shows up because they're getting bullied or in trouble, uh, it, it immediately it's the pipeline to prisons, and they're pulled out of any opportunity um, to move forward. And it's it's uh, it's sad. I mean, it's, it's really upsetting. I would, you know I would follow your comments. I mean, these stats don't surprise me at all. Um, you know, living, being gay twenty four seven, doing this work. Um, you know, the notion that the LGBT community is a monolithic community, I know through my lived experience and through my work that it's not the case at all. The fact that, you know, I was raised by a black, single, lesbian mother out in Royal, Illinois. That's um, awesome. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I, <laughs> um, so, so from a very early age, I, I have known, like, you know, our community is super diverse. And, I mean, the heartbreaking part when I see these stats is that, you know, when we talk about LGBT issues, when we kind of like lump everyone together, the very nuanced stories and issues that folks are facing kind of get lost. And I think it's really important to kind of tease that out and like look at how particular people are made vulnerable in our communities because all LGBT people aren't vulnerable in the same way. So right. it's just not the case. I mean, if you think about your class, um, your race, your gender, your nationality, you know, documented. And so those are things that are really important, these stats, and it's really great that work that MAP's doing, and like Williams Institute, because I think it's really important to get that data so we can really articulate what we know from a lived experience, but I know a lot of people need the data to really believe us, and so I think it's really important that that exists. Okay, and Dale? Well, the poverty numbers are interesting because I remember distinctly an opinion from Justice Scalia a few years ago suggesting that LGBT people were disproportionately wealthy and didn't need the protections of employment discrimination laws. And I think the data is undercutting that argument significantly. The other thing that's significant is the map that you showed earlier of the United States and the employment and other civil rights protections. If you look at a couple of those maps, they almost perfectly match the division in the country between Republican-dominated legislatures and Democratic-dominated legislatures. Great. That's a um, great observation. Well, let's just jump right into this and talk about, and, and I think Naomi started us down this road around, what are some of the new or continuing rights issues um, that really will be important to the LGBT community over the next several years? And we'd like to start. Tyrone, why don't you start? Sure, I'll yeah. start. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, obviously my work is going to reflect kind of what I think are important issues, but I think particularly around the criminal justice system, I think the stats that you show, and there are more um, data out there um, that really shows that how LGBT people are disproportionately pushed into the criminal justice system, particularly those who are identified of color. I think that's really important to talk about. Um, and I think that as this conversation is moving forward around looking at mass incarceration, I think that we're having, finally as a country, having a, a conversation about the impact of mass incarceration. But I think one thing that's really important for the LGBT movement is to really talk about how we as a community, particularly those of color, are being pushed into this system by, for example, the profiling of trans women of color as sex workers, um, to you know, the pushing of LGBT youth into the juvenile justice system. But then looking not only at that, how people are being pushed into this system, but how we are particularly being treated, abused, um, and experiencing violence in institutions like prisons, juvenile justice um, facilities, um, particularly when you look at issues of solitary confinement. Um, a lot of LGBT people, um, Black and Pink, which is an organization that supports uh, LGBT inmates and formerly incarcerated folks, show that, that a high number, majority of the survey respondents said they had experienced solitary confinement. And so this is very much an LGBT issue, but I think it's hard because I think a lot of people see the LGBT 
you know, issues that's very singular. And I think we're getting at the point in our movement where we are saying like these aren't singular issues and we really need to talk about how particular people are marginalized within our community because I think until we do that, I think we're not really going to reach the most vulnerable people. You know, we can pass on discrimination laws, but then when you have trans women of color being locked up for sex work and then they experience violence, you know, the non-discrimination law is not necessarily going to protect them in those situations. Although it would help because one reason why that trans women find, uh, particular trans women of color, turn to sex work is because they're being discriminated. They can't have any other legal. What else are you going to do? You need to survive. And so it's really infuriating that to think that we live in a society that does not think these homophobic, transphobic laws are not going to have material impacts on people. You know, and so on one hand you're saying you shouldn't be a sex worker, but on the other hand you're saying you don't have a right to a job. Like to me, there's something really absurd there, and that you, you know, and as human beings, of course we're going to try to, we're going to do whatever we need to do in order to survive. And so I think that one of the major issues, um, uh, both um, Naomi and I are involved in this criminal justice working group, and that's where we're focused simply on um, the criminal justice system, how it impacts LGBTQ and people living in HIV and AIDS. And so I think that's definitely very much an emergent issue. And I'm, I'm really excited because I think there's some traction happening there. I think people are re realizing that LGBT piece in um, the conversation around mass incarceration. And, and I would add to that, because that, one, that, that with some of the um, criminal justice reform we're seeing that on both sides of the aisle, I mean, our motivations are very different, but if, if we could hit the results. And, uh, and for people with HIV, because uh, I, I think our organizations both go beyond the um, LGBT community and that. Uh, we're finding things like access, so, you know, can you get PrEP? And then and if your insurance company covers it, but if you're a person of color, it's much harder to get. There's these uh, false obstacles put in the way. And so, we, you know, we see, we see that play out in, in, uh, in other ways as well. Uh, uh, mainly for my work has been around which is sort of two sides of the same coin of, uh, of trying to win LGBT anti-discrimination protections. And then the, just the ferocious backlash we faced uh, after the marriage win. And we really saw first um, in Indiana with our uh, with Governor Pence, who's just the nominee. Yes. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and you know, and he, he is a true believer. I mean, there's some politicians that use our, our issues uh, for for cheap political points. I mean, he really does not like the LGBT community. He really, um, it, it's personal to him. And, uh, and what we've seen in these laws is just a, an incredible attack on, on all of our rights, but r almost immediately zeroed in onto the trans community. And, uh, and, and the, most, the most vulnerable, I mean, in, in a true bully fashion, you find the most vulnerable person you can to go after. And, and so it's kids, it's, it's kids that are not able to go to the bathroom, they're having to hold their bathroom in, in school, are afraid to participate in sports, and so they're automatically sort of pulled out of, a, of, a, of their ability to advance and move forward, and it's, it's, a, it, it's really been frightening, but what's been sort of, uh, that gives me heart, is first in Indiana and then in the country to watch when the corporations stand uh, stand with us and really put their uh, the money uh, where their uh, values are, where they claim their values were, to to pull business out of North Carolina, to to not move forward forward on a um, a giant project in Indiana, and because that's where that's where it hits a lot of these legislators. And then and thanks to the Obama administration and, and precedents that many of our groups have won, to be able to use Title Seven and Title Nine to start expanding. Uh, where we're able to go and what we're able to do, and as, and as though that starts working through the courts as well as through uh, uh, the departments, uh, uh, through the Obama administration, we're, we're, we're seeing meaningful progress. And Dale? Well, I would, I would say at the federal level, we're looking to try to pass some form of equality legislation that will protect people from discrimination in employment and housing and public accommodations and in a variety of other areas. That itself is an uphill battle. And then you've got um, the fact that 28 states, as was mentioned earlier, still don't have any kind of protection for LGBT people. That's going to be a, a, a battle given what we know the political map is at this uh, point. And it's especially a battle on transgender rights, as uh, Jim was saying. If you look at the Williams Institute, and they've got an excellent website with all kinds of information 
about uh, discrimination in public policy, and you uh, analyze and compare the statistics for discrimination, experiences of discrimination in every area, in employment and housing, in every area, what, however bad it is for gay, lesbian, and bisexual people, it is many times worse for transgender people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one interesting thing about what Dale is saying is that as much as these emerging protections are happening with Title, Title VII and Title IX, we don't have public accommodations protections <coughs> based on sex. So we will never get that federally unless we pass federal legislation. And I think that that's an interesting sort of strategy that we in the movement are talking about is we need this comprehensive bill, even if employment is covered through the EEOC interpretations and expanding court definition and so forth, that sex is not covered by public accommodations law nationally. And so I think that's really important. And um, I'll say that, you know, from Matt's perspective, I lead our policy work, but we do a lot of messaging work. And we actually are releasing an ad on Thursday night during the Republican National Convention on Fox News that is uh, directly about this bathroom issue and, and how can we because this is really what folks have latched onto, but I fundamentally don't believe that that is really what the issue is. The issue is that they want to be able to fire someone for being gay, that they want to be able to kick the, or looking gay or kick someone out of the apartment next to them because someone is living with a partner or because they think they're trans. And I think that they've realized that there's a lot of fear around bathrooms, and so they've seized onto this and they've seized onto the most vulnerable people in our community, and so we are really working on how can we build up support in that area because everyone needs to use the restroom, everyone needs to feel safe. And when you look at the statistics about trans people in bathrooms, as Jim mentioned, they're holding in, they're violently abused for using a restroom. And that is obscene in this country. I would say that the legislation, the comprehensive legislation that Naomi's talking about is the Equality Act. And uh, I think many of our groups have, have been part of authoring that. And it, it also protects women. I mean, it's a really robust, you know, we had Many of us had criticisms of ENDA or the approach to ENDA. This is an incredibly robust legislation. Um, I don't see any possibility of it passing with this Congress, but uh, certainly, you know, we'll see after November in the Senate, and maybe, you know, it, uh, I mean, things are always moving in some ways in a different or more rapid way than we thought. But to at least have something to be able to frame what we're fighting for and to talk about uh, is uh, is helpful. So I, I want to take a turn here and pick up a little bit on something that Tyrone mentioned in his opening statements. Um, what I think is in terms of institutional, uh, um, intersectional advocacy, right? This idea that we really, uh, it's just not about this large umbrella of, you know, the, the LGBTQ communities. And I often try to use the word communities because we are, right, uh, a myriad of communities. And when you look at race, you look at gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, many groups nationally, right, and, and even locally, uh, many cities were really concentrating on marriage equality. That was all that they were really thinking about. And um, we know that there are many other issues, just from what we've talked about here, that um, we're concerned with, that families in particular are concerned with. And so how has that been... Um, sort of heard from national organizations for whom this is a term. This is going to be different in terms of how they do their work. If they can't sort of be focused on one issue, uh, because at the end of the day, we're impacted by all those issues. You know, I just don't show up and one day, oh, one day I'm black, the other day I'm, you know, I'm a lesbian. I, I'm all those things at all times. <laughs> so um, I, it, it, is, it is really important that we address the work in a way that takes that into consideration, and, and what's the conversation happening around those pieces? I know we've talked a little bit about this, Jim, in terms of people really wanting to be focused on one piece of the work, and that's it. Well, I, and you can't be, I mean, I, I look for Lambda, and, and the highest uh, in the marriage cases ever took of our docket was just about 30%. Our docket, the majority of cases have always been workplace cases. If you can't uh, make money and feed your family and pay your rent, there's you know, your marriage is going to suck. Uh, um, so it's, uh, you know, so you have to have all of those, uh, you have to have all the pieces together, and a lot of it, and where, and where we see in intersections, much of it is around access. So whether it's access to uh, trans, uh, the, the treatment you may need, whether it's uh, access to HIV medications, access to contraception, and uh, um, the ability to make individual autonomous decisions for yourself and for your family, uh, they all go hand in hand. So uh, when we looked at some of these 
uh, like the uh, religious refusal law that passed in Indiana, and even the subsequent partial fix, it still didn't correct the ability for pharmacists to deny women contraceptives even if they needed them for cancer treatment, which is often uh, the case. And, and, and I also don't think that's not intentional, right? Like, uh, um, there certainly is a goal to, um, to target women, and, and I think at the LGBT community, that our opposition was very smart because they recognized, you know, years before uh, the marriage victory ultimately came down, that they were on the losing end. So it became a, it became a story of um, that they're the victims uh, because, you know, they don't like what you're doing. Um, but also, they, they attached their bigotry to our momentum. And so as we were moving forward, even in some states where we were moving forward marriage legislatively, you would see amendments attached where you would make compromises to anti-discrimination protections that would affect far more than our, than our community, and it, which also speaks to our organization's responsibility to clean that up. You know, I mean, the, you know, there was a huge effort among our, you know, to, to have momentum. We have so many states that had marriage before you hit the Supreme Court, and uh, and we did some damage on the one. And uh, and so there's a there's a real responsibility of of our community to to join with our our partners and make sure that 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 that's uh, rectified and improved. And, and Naomi, with the work that your group does around LGBT families, how have you seen this come to fruition? I mean, I think we have to recognize that even though marriage is now available, there are lots of reasons why people won't marry. And we know that nationally more children are born not into a married couple than are gay or straight. And so I think recognizing that our families have been living that experience of not being recognized and what that means. And so we are perfect advocates for thinking about broader family definitions that impact lots of communities, whether it's you know here in Chicago passing you know, a sick days ordinance that allows you to take time off for someone other than to whom you're legally related. I think it's really important. And we know about that, whether going back to the AIDS epidemic, and you need to take time off to care for a partner or a family member, you know, someone part of your chosen family. And so I think that the families work, we have been doing that work, and organizations at this on this table have been doing the legal work around expanding family definitions and expanding, even if you didn't get a second parent adoption, even if you're not married, you should still be able to access and be able to visit a child from whom you parented. Or you just had a court case in Maryland about de facto parenting access for a couple that the other parent didn't have a legal connection and they split up and the other parent didn't want that parent to have any access. And so the court said, no, you, can't, you look like a duck, you walk like a duck, you're a duck, you're a parent, you've been doing the work of parenting. And I think that those are important victories for us and so many other communities. And so I think we have a lot to share about how we have been pushing institutions to change and to be more welcoming, and I think we can apply that to broader issues, and I think we have a responsibility to do that. And Dale, with your work, certainly as a professor, and I know you work uh, and teach uh, classes around civil rights, and in particular as they relate to the LGBT community, how do you see this idea around institutional advocacy impacting any of the work that you're doing, or how you're talking to students, any of that? Well, students, um, I think, are certainly aware that uh, their lives are, uh, are across multiple domains at one time. And so uh, they're impacted by all of the questions that, we're, that we face. And I think our advocacy needs to reflect that too. I do think organization, and we've always in some ways uh, acknowledged the idea that gay rights, as we once called it, is more than just about anti-discrimination law. I mean, AIDS, for example, say, well, AIDS wasn't a gay issue because more than just gay people got it. What we recognized from the beginning, I think, how important it was uh, to, to so many people. Um, and the same thing goes for a lot of the challenges we face now. Okay. Anything that you want to add? Uh, I just want to say, I think we're at a turning point in our movement in which, I think there are like very clear issues, there are LGBT issues, like obviously marriage, non-discrimination, which is still very much an issue that we're to uh, address, but I think once you start getting to particular co co of the communities that you you know that you mentioned, I think it's hard. Even people, honestly, in the LGBT movement, particularly, I would say even like white folks of a certain class, to really understand that this is an LGBT issue. I think honestly, some people even in our own community don't understand how the criminal justice system. A reform the criminal justice system is an LGBT issue. I think our organizations get it, they're all working on it. But I think the larger community 
I think there's some work we need to do to bring our communities along. And I think that, to me, I think that's a challenge, but also it's really exciting. Because I do, I think one of the beautiful things about being like within the LGBT community is that we can use either our sexual orientation, our gender identity, to connect with people who we may not otherwise connect, whether like other races, other ethnicities, people who are undocumented, um, people from other parts of the world. Because I do think that being queer or trans in this world, even though there's a, there's a lot of infighting, I do think there's something about it. I think after Orlando, you saw that. And I do think we need, I think there's a power there that we can really bring, we can be a bridge to the larger world and saying like these, all these issues, everyone should have like a vibrant and wonderful life. And I think we can use our experiences as being queer or trans to really make those connections and to really translate to the larger world. And so I do think our organizations are learning how to not only kind of undo some of the damage that was done, but also how to bring to be leaders and to bring our community, those who are not really doing the advocacy work, in on this conversation and get them like really feel invested in this. And so I think while that's a challenge, I do I do we we can do it. I mean like like what just happened like recently with the whole marriage thing. So I I, I think there's an opportunity there, but I do also think on the flip side, it can become destructive and it really depends on us as a community what we're willing to do and including those of us who are work at like, you know, at LGBT organizations, I think the next few years are, are going to be, I think, really important few years. Great. I was just going to say the other piece that we didn't mention, but you sort of alluded to, is this issue around class. That we we don't really sometimes we talk about things as race, but really it's about class. And then the day we're reluctant to say that because I think for many people they still assume that everybody's doing great and that everybody's just doing great, and, and we know that's not the case. We started to hear organizations talk a little bit more about poverty and. We'll talk in greater detail about that in the second second panel. What did you want to? I just wanted to say that I think there's also kind of what move, what organizations have been doing and and how that's communicated outwardly and with funders. Because you know to hear Jim say at the highest point marriage was only thirty percent of Lambda's portfolio. Well, that is surprising to some people who you know marriage was such a public thing and it was important that it was public. It was important you saw the video that Richard showed earlier with his beautiful home. Like it is important that we share those stories. And plus, we have funders who are saying, oh, marriage, we're done. Right? We have a huge yeah. funder that has exactly. walked out of the space. And I think that, like, are you name no. no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that it's important that we as organizations tell you all what we're up to. Because we have been doing other work. It just hasn't been so public. Or it hasn't been the lead case that's on the cover of our, of our websites and mm -hmm. so forth. And, and I love the criminal justice working group that um, Tyrone and I and folks from Lambda are on. Very few of those people have funded positions to solely do that. They are finding time and other things they're doing, and, but these organizations have said, we're going to commit to you doing that without money tied to criminal justice reform or funding, right? And so we are, we're doing it, even if we're not talking about it and <clears throat> funders aren't saying, I'm going to give you grants solely for that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's more going on behind the scenes than we share all the time. Go ahead, Melinda. Sure, go ahead. I, I do think that. Uh, there is a problem of limited resources and resource allocation. I'll just tell you, I live in, in Dallas, Texas. The Texas legislature meets once every two years, and every time it meets, it's a threat to liberty and human decency. And in Texas, next spring, we're going to face, I'm guessing, dozens, if not scores, of bills that are directed at LGBT people. They'll take one form or another. They'll deal with bathrooms or single-sex facilities, or they'll deal with something that's called or covered as religious freedom that will be targeted at LGBT people. And in Texas, there's basically one statewide group that has one lobbyist and a board of people who don't get paid and extremely limited funding. And so very difficult choices have to be made about where you can vote those, those resources. Well, if you looked at that map of where is the red, the state groups in those states have one paid staffer if there's even a functioning state group. So resources. So I want to remind you, if you do have any questions, please uh, use your uh, golden rod card and you can send those up. I, I just want to spend the last uh, mo few moments that we have talking about some strategies. Like, what are some action steps? Um, are there things that people can do today? How do we move, as you said, you know, we say move the needle. How do we move this forward in a way that is going to be more holistic, 
more inclusive. How, how do we do that? Well, I think uh, the marriage the marriage fight taught us some lessons. I mean, it was the first time we had this incredibly uh, wide coalitions that pulled together our, our allies and straight groups and and, uh, and sort of traditional progressive groups that we hadn't involved before. And uh, and I certainly know in Illinois it it led to more communication on immigration reform, on um, on issues around racial justice, on um, some of the trans issues. Uh, the creation of uh, Pride Action Tank, which you'll be hearing more about, was was one of was sort of one of these beautiful results of, of lessons learned of not having people all around the table at one point. And uh, and I also believe that there's an opportunity to uh, to to help connect to other progressive movements, like the Black Lives Matter movement. I think is a really a, an easy one to understand if. if when you think about, for the LGBT community, we know from raids and AIDS, we know from getting arrested in bars, and uh, you know, Lambda had a case not even five years ago where the 70 and, and plus older leather guys in an Atlanta bar are, are pushed down on a floor and harassed by cops. And we know what it's like to be locked out of the health system and to be, and to be um, institutionally locked out of the ability to even get basic health care. So when, when we see uh, the Black Lives Matter movement started by two queer women that, uh, uh, that's calling, you know, first for accountability, but to be included in the very systems that our country should be affording us, th those are logical places where we can all step up. I think, I think another way for telling stories, I honestly think what really made the marriage movement a success is because we were coming out. You know, legislators, um, the president, court would not have gone that direction and did not feel that society was kind of going that direction. And the only way that it happened is people telling their stories. And I, I feel that when it comes to the most marginalized folks in our community, we need to encourage, support, and really to shine light on the people who are the most vulnerable in our community. As messy it may be, some people may not be comfortable that some of us are sex workers. Some of us may not be comfortable that some of us um, have sex in public spaces. Some of us may not be comfortable that some of us are drug users. But guess what? They're a part of our community and they matter just as much as anyone else. And it shouldn't be someone who wants to get married, live out in the burbs, if that's what you want, wonderful. But that's not everyone. And so I think that once we be able to, in a very public way, to tell our stories as nuanced, as difficult, as complex as they are, I really don't think that we're really going to move in the direction that we're, or at least going in the direction where we need to be. And so I think a part of that, and not only in terms of reflecting the work that we do, but also really telling those stories and not to be afraid of them. Because I do think, particularly in the legal world, you kind of need to kind of have the perfect client. And so sometimes our, the work that we do, those of us who are lawyers or in the policy world, sometimes it can be kind of hard to bring that in there because that's kind of like how you train to kind of, you need to find the right client, the one who's not too messy, you know, the one the judge is not going to feel comfortable with. And you can with. do it with marriage. Right, and right. All these but, right. Yeah, when you're talking about sex workers and drug yeah. users, you're all comfortable <laughs> people too. <laughs> but our, we live in a society that doesn't see it that way, but I do think that we can get people to understand that those folks who kind of live in the margins, I mean, you think of Orange and New Black, I do think, you know, as, you know, there are problematic features of the show, but I do think it does humanize people who are institutionalized in a way that I don't think that we've really have seen. And so I think that's, I honestly, that cultural change work, I think that's where most of the work is. You know, as much as lawyers like to think that, you know, we're the center of the universe, we're not. I think we can't really do our work unless people are doing cultural change work. So those are the artists. Those are the people who are just telling their stories to their families, their co-workers or whatnot. Those are the people who are doing the work that allow us to be successful in the courts or in terms of our, our advocacy with the, at the agencies. And so I think that's going to be an important part of the strategy moving forward. Dale? Uh, one, of the, one of the, I think there are a lot of explanations for why the, the marriage movement was ultimately successful, and it certainly involves lawyers in part, even though we're not the only people in the world. Um, but one of the reasons I think, I think it was successful is that we managed to translate that cause into terms, into language, and into values that a lot of people could identify with. And so when we did the research looking at what would be successful, it turns out that just starting off the conversation by saying, because you oppose marriage, you're a bigot, 
It wasn't a great way of starting the conversation. <laughs> and just saying it's my civil right to be able to get married also wasn't very persuasive to people. But was, what was persuasive to people was saying that marriage is about things you do understand and identify with, like commitment and love, being with another person. We all have a desire uh, in many ways to share our lives with that one other person in life with whom we can suffer and die. And so people ultimately got that at a level that was um, almost sub-rational, and it persuaded people. Um, I think the challenges we face, especially on trans rights, I would say, are challenges to try to translate the experiences that transgender people have into the kinds of things that others can understand. There is no, I can't think of another public issue in this country on which there is a greater distance between what is taken to be common sense, men shouldn't be in women's bathrooms or showers, and what we know about public policy, which is that the sexual predation and all the other things that people say they fear actually don't happen That's when you look at the numbers. I cannot think of another issue. Maybe there are others that are similar, but I can't think of an issue on which there's a greater gap between those two things. And somehow we have to bridge that gap. Naomi, any strategies from your vantage point? I mean, I think I've always thought about policy change as, as these two together, that you need, that for some, for some legislators, you need the hard facts, you need cost estimates, you need Google's going to not place their data facility in your city. You need that, because some folks need that cover, they need economic impact cover. And then I think there are the values that we have to draw on, and thankfully we went on both fronts. And I think that with marriage, we went, we went on both fronts these various issues, we went on both fronts, right? It's good for business to have diverse workers. We need a diverse workforce. Non-discrimination laws are important. You have, a, you have a business case for that. You also have the value of people should be able to work hard and provide for themselves. And we don't have that right now for trans people and LGBT people in this country. And so I feel like we are building that on non-discrimination, for example, but that it always has to go hand in hand. And thankfully, we have organizations that are great at one and some that are great at others and some that are great at both. We just need to keep, keep pushing that forward. And, and the people that we won over in the marriage fight, and we're seeing this in others, we won over the people that said they were against marriage. That, and they're the ones that flipped. The ones that were they couldn't decide. They never, you know, they're those people that never decide. And they and they didn't change at all. It was the it was the no's um, that were against it that that began to see our lives and and uh, and switch. So there's there's hope. There's hope. Well, I just heard you use the word uh, diversity and. You know, a couple of times, and, and I guess I'm wondering how successful we will be, particularly with your references to the Black Lives Movement, uh, uh, Jim, if we do not address issues around racial justice in our work. Because if you address an issue of racial justice, you don't have to worry about diversity, right? And so how, how are we going to bring that to fore? Because that is, it's critical. I think one of the reasons why we, we do not hear about the fact that this year more trans women of color have been killed than in previous years is because they are trans women of color, right? They're trans and they're women of color, right? And so how, how is that work going to happen in, in our organizations nationally, locally? Any ideas about that? Anyone? Can well, I would say that we have to stop um, these efforts of politicians uh, creating this environment of hate where, you, where you're legalizing uh, um, discrimination, where you're um, calling out kids and uh, saying that they're somehow not normal or not worth the, uh, uh, the same as all Americans. And, and so you, we've created in, in Orlando to, to, to see that horrific uh, um, killing of 49 um, uh, brothers and sisters of our community. When, when politicians go out and, and use this as a tool and they, and they normalize um, this kind of hate, uh, you created an environment for it, and so I mean, that's, that to me, that, that at least for Land Illegal and for myself personally, that's a place that we can start um, to fight back and, and to shut those people down. I think that speaking of like, from folks who work actually at LGBT organizations, I do think it does also mean that we need to just say things are racist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we say things like disproportionately impact people of color. That's racism. <laughs> uh, that's what that is. And I think it sounds easier. I mean, it is easier to say it that way. But it's racism. And I think particularly LGBT organizations, I think we can really move things
things along by saying that racism exists and that we as a community this needs to be a central part of our work. Actually at NCLA we're in the process of going through some self-examination around what does it mean to be a racial justice organization. And so we're going to have to have hard conversations, but you know what, I'm proud that our organization is going, to, going through that process because we really do believe that we are committed to racial justice, but that doesn't mean to take certain stances that may not be popular, like even in the LGBT world, in the LGBT space, but it's because we are committed to that, and so I do think that's how I see that happening, that people are just owning that and just really taking that leadership and taking those risks to really put themselves out the line as leaders and as organizations. Well, as the data wonk, I would say that, you know, I let the data drive that, and so, you know, Tyrone mentioned the chart with the youth and the facilities, and 85% of LGBT kids in juvenile justice facilities are kids of color, right? So, like, the issue is kids of color get locked up. LGBT kids who get locked up are kids of color, and so I think if we think about what the data says about LGBT and there's a new study out from Glisten about school push out, and that it's brown and black queer kids who are getting pushed out of school at higher rates. And so I feel like the data shows us that our work has to be intersectional because it's not just because they're gay, it's not just because they're black. It is the two of those together. And I think that the other exciting thing is that MAP always partners with progressive organizations, as do many of, of us, and that progressive orgs are starting to get it too, right? Like, at least in the school push out sphere, there's been all this conversation about non conforming girls of color getting pushed out of schools. Well, we have a strong stake in that work, right? Whether they identify as LGBT or not, if you're non-conforming in some way, you've got a target on your back. And so I think that, that we also have that stake and can really work with organizations that are doing that kind of intersectional work and, and come to them and say, hey, we get it, we want to do this. And we may not be perfect at it, as Tyrone said, we have to do the work too. But I think that that they look to us because we want our marriage in many ways of like, what's your secret sauce? And I think that it's an opportunity for us to say we really care about poverty. How can we get involved in the poverty fight? How can we get involved in the criminal justice fight? And because it is our issue too. Great, I think I have a question here made for you, Dale. Um, what are your thoughts on asserting the Constitution's guarantee on the separation of church and state, given all the religious exemptions all the religious exemption clauses uh, used to um, use with regard to state and federal laws for LGBT protection? Great question. Um, this may be my next exam question. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to get too different. <laughs> Does this mean live stream? <laughs> um, I think uh, whether we can use the religion clauses and especially the establishment clauses it depends on what form the legislation takes. If it takes the form of seeming to endorse a particular um, sect, a particular kind of religion, then certainly that would be problematic. I think some of the laws, like the Mississippi law that passed that endorsed a certain view of marriage and a certain view of human sexuality and a certain view of biological maleness and femaleness, from a religious basis may be challenged on those grounds. The Establishment Clause jurisprudence, however, is pretty forgiving of state laws. And so I don't, I don't expect that the ordinary run-of-the-mill RIFRA or something like that is going to uh, be challenged, likely be challenged on those grounds, at least not successfully. I think more uh, fruitfully, potentially, are challenges to these laws based on equal protection. And in fact, I was going to say this in response to the question you asked earlier, that, that um, one of the constitutional issues to be watching for in the immediate future is the question of whether courts will systematically and around the country begin to apply the strong presumption of unconstitutionality to sexual orientation and other discrimination that it now applies to race. And the model has been the black civil rights movement and the efforts to get the court to do that over a period of decades. Great. Excellent. And here's one more. Um, what would you say to a business owner who doesn't understand why he or she uh, shouldn't be able to choose whom to do business with? Well, I mean, I'm very pro-business. I'm pretty libertarian in a lot of ways. But I would say that we made a decision 100, 150 years ago in this country that the way we were going to deal, well, first of all, we were going to regulate businesses in some ways 
for public safety and for public welfare. And so that businesses have to abide by the same rules, and that's been a part of our law for a very long time. The second thing I would say is that at about, depending on how you count it, 60 years or so ago, we decided that the way we were going to deal with group, the phenomenon of group-based discrimination in this country is to have group-based group protection laws. And that's the only issue here. It's not you can't hire who you want or you can't fire who you want. It's that you can't do so on one of these prohibited bases that we know to be irrational, persistent, and almost uh, completely resistant to change. Um, Anyone else want to ask? Well, then we have time for just one more question. Let's talk a little bit about the presidential race. Um, how can um, our various communities have an impact, do you think, on this race that's in front of us, uh, the upcoming? presidential race? We can vote. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, you know, donate money. You can uh, organize and go door to door. Uh, I, 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 um, I can't remember a, an election, certainly in my lifetime, where I feel like the very soul of the country is at stake. And, uh, and we have a very clear um, uh, decision I, or, or, or what, what each of those are going to do. When we look at uh, Donald Trump, I don't know I don't know what he would have done because I feel like it changes every few moments. But uh, but with Pence, he has someone very consistent, uh, and and Pence, you know, uh, was very clear that he was going to move forward on this, uh, the RIFRA, the religious refusal laws, and uh, and he is uh, he's been put forth as someone that is to assure um, that you know the, the most conservative base of, of the Republican Party that they can count on, and. Uh, and on the on the other side, we've we've seen a, a commitment of, of the candidate and uh, and and the administration, the Obama administration, to carry on uh, the work, which is uh, some of the biggest advances we've had. Uh, so it's a um, we we have quite a, a fascinating fight ahead of ourselves. Naomi, are, will, will your group or have you done any polling or any kind of data collection around uh, the LGBT community and the other? We have not, and that's not really our area. I think mm -hmm. mo more we have been looking at you know, what are the effective messages, as Dale said. Um, you know, particularly know knowing that 70% you know, of Americans support non-discrimination for LGBT right. people. And so you know, that is 70% of all people, not 70% of Democrats. And so you know, how do we let folks know, you know that the values that they hold aren't being held by you know, candidates or are going to be directly attacked by candidates? And I think that that's where we can appeal to the soul of the nation. Like, what, what aspirational do we hope for? Mm -hmm. And what do we care about in terms of individual people? And I think the ad that we're running, for example, really speaks to someone's humanity. And do you really, can you look one person in the eye and say that you actually don't deserve humanity? And I think that the more that we push on that, my hope is that people will vote their conscience. Um, I, on the more wonky side, <laughs> I think one thing that's really important is that we look at the transition, no matter what administration comes in, and making sure all the gains that we've been able to achieve over the last um, few years, we don't lose them, because a lot of them were administrative, and they can go away like that, and we can live in a completely different world um, as a community. So I think making sure that we keep those gains, but also make sure that things that we've been trying to do over the last few years, particularly our criminal justice, are seen by the next administration as LGBT issues, so that doesn't get lost. And then going back to what I said earlier, I think one thing we can do as individuals is that we tell our stories to our family, talk about like how these these type of policy proposals that are being like you know put out there by the campaign would impact us. You know that may mean having really scary conversations about some parts of our lives that we typically don't talk about, even though you may be out to your family, you may be talking about drug use, and maybe you were, were or currently are a sex worker, whatever it may be, that you're somehow involved in the system, that I think those type of stories really do influence how the people in our lives vote. And so I think that it's really important that we use these type of moments to kind of like share that. I have to say this is one election that I do not look at primarily through an LGBT lens. I'm worried about literally the whole world in this election. And, and by the way, to the extent we can discern what his views are, and they do tend to be 
interchangeable. He may be the most, I think he is, the most pro-LGBT Republican nominee ever. Um, that's admittedly a low bar. <laughs> they, they, probably, they probably is. And it makes not a bit of difference to me. Because I don't want a president who mocks a person with disabilities on television. I don't want a president who uh, says that an entire group of people should be banned from the country because of their religion. I don't want a president who says we're going to build a wall that we're never going to build and that would be a terrible mistake if we ever did build it. And on and on and on it goes. I literally think so much more is at stake in this election than LGBT rights that it's not even on the radar for me. There's so many other things that are. Well, thank you all very much. This is an ongoing conversation, and um, we just we are just getting started. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation after lunch, and we'll be talking a little bit more about socioeconomic issues. Please help me thank our panelists.